Saturn Theory by E.V. Cochran. The Saturn Theory, in addition to presenting a comprehensive model of ancient myth, offers a radically different approach to understanding the recent history of the solar system. Briefly, the theory posits that the neighboring planets only recently settled into their current orbits. The Earth, formerly being involved in a unique planetary configuration of sorts, together with Saturn, Venus, and Mars. As the terrestrial sky watcher looked upwards, he saw a spectacular and awe-inspiring apparition dominating the celestial landscape. At the heart of heaven, the massive gas giant Saturn appeared fixed atop the north polar axis. With Venus and Mars set within its center, like two concentric orbs, see figure one. Where Venus is the green orb, and Mars the innermost red orb. Kind of looks like one of those olives. I wonder if that's why they made it look like that. The olive, that is. It looks just like one, doesn't it? The theory holds that the origin of ancient myth and religion, indeed the origin of the primary institutions of civilization itself, is inextricably linked to the numinous appearance and evolutionary history of this unique congregation of planets. How does one go about documenting this extraordinary claim? Extraordinary claims, it is commonly said, require extraordinary evidential support in order to be believed. While I believe the Saturn theory can and eventually will meet this crucial test, it goes without saying that a discussion of the various lines of evidence pointing to the polar configuration would require several volumes in order to make a compelling case. In this brief overview, alas, I can do no more than offer a small sampling of the relevant evidence. If the truth be known, the Saturn theory suffers from an embarrassment of riches with respect to evidence which supports the central tenets of the theory early descriptions of the Sun, and various planets from Mesopotamia and elsewhere describe them as occupying impossible positions and moving in a manner which defies astronomical reality, as currently understood, that is. The ancient Sun God, for example, is said to rise and set upon the same sacred mountain. Planet Venus is described as standing at the heart of heaven or within the crescent of sin. With respect to evidence which supports the central tenets, of the theory. Mars is pointed to as a principal agent behind eclipses of the ancient sun god. While not one of these scenarios is possible given the current order of the solar system, each is perfectly consistent with the history of respective planets in the polar configuration as reconstructed by Saturnus. The testimony from ancient myth and folklore is equally unequivocal that the respective planets once moved on radically different orbits and reigned catastrophe from the skies. Even if the message has been overlooked and ostracized by everyone except Velikovsky, thus numerous cultures tell of a time when different suns ruled the heavens. This belief was especially common in the New World. The idea that the sun was not eternal was shared by other American Indian tribes so widely that we consider it must have been part of their belief long before any culture had arisen in the Americas. The Popol Vuh, lauded as the Mayan Bible, attests to the same idea. Their previous sun is described as follows. Like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly it was not the same sun which we see, it is said in their old tales. Equally widespread are traditions which report that a great monster once eclipsed the sun and brought the world to the brink of destruction. Countless cultures preserve memory of the terrifying time when Venus assumed a comet-like form. A spectacular conjunction of planets dominated the celestial landscape. Such traditions can be documented from one culture to another, and upon a systematic analysis, reveal numerous analogous structural details. A telltale sign that they were inspired by common experience of spectacular celestial events rather than creative imagination and fantasy. In addition to the remarkably detailed and consistent testimony from ancient myth and folklore, the artistic record likewise provides compelling evidence that the planets only recently moved on radically different orbits. Consider, for example, three images depicted in figure two here. As I have documented, such images are ubiquitous in the prehistoric rock art of every inhabited continent. Hitherto, they have been interpreted as drawings of the sun by virtually all leading authorities on ancient art and religion. 
This, despite the fact that they do not have any obvious resemblance to the current solar orb. It is noteworthy that the ancient sun god was depicted in the very same manner by the earliest civilizations in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Figure 3, for example, shows an Akkadian seal, in which the shamash, shamash disk, is represented as an eye-like object, as in the first image in Figure 2. Figure 4 shows the shamash disk as an eight-pointed star, or wheel. Figure 5 shows the shamash disk as an eight-petaled flower. Numerous other variations upon these common themes could be provided, all impossible to reconcile with the appearance of the solar orb. That's figure four and five. It is at this point that the researcher is presented with a theoretical dilemma, the successful resolution of which promises to unlock the secret of our planet's extraordinary recent prehistory. If one elects to dismiss the specific and consistent imagery associated with these ancient solar images as a product of creative imagination. The typical approach of conventional art historians, one is also forced to dismiss the equally widespread testimony that different suns prevailed in ancient times. This approach has little to recommend it, for it involves nothing less than turning a deaf ear to the testimony of our ancestors, and in any case, which thus far has produced precious few insights into the origin of ancient symbolism and myth. Yet, the alternative is equally unthinkable, for it involves accepting these endlessly reoccurring images as accurate drawings of the ancient sun, albeit one different in nature and appearance than the currently prevailing. As bizarre as this possibility appears at first glance, it does have much to recommend it. The ancient Babylonians were careful to distinguish Shamash from the current sun. It was this little known datum which led Velikovsky to consider the possibility that Saturn formerly appeared more prominent, perhaps even serving as a sun-like body for the satellite Earth. Velikovsky's seminal insight, in turn, served as a theoretical foundation for the subsequent researches of Talbot, Cardona, Rose, Trussman, Newgrosh, and others, who offered further evidence for the basic claim that Saturn once dominated the heavens, a fact reflected in the otherwise puzzling prominence accorded this planet in the earliest pantheons. The Saturn theory receives additional support from the representation of the planet Venus in ancient art. A straightforward interpretation of the various images superimposed upon the solar disk in figure 2 would Understand the first as an eye, the second as an eight-spoked wheel or star, and the third as an eight-petaled flower. Now it is a remarkable fact that the planet Venus is consistently associated with these very forms, from one ancient culture to another. The ancient Sumerians, for example, represented Venus as Inanna, as an eye goddess, eight-pointed star, and eight-petaled flower or rosette. Consider the figurine represented in figure six here thousands of which were discovered by Max Mallowan during his excavations of the Anana precinct at Urk-Uruk. Similar eye goddesses have been found throughout the ancient world, from Neolithic Europe to India. Figure 7 shows an early cylinder seal from the Jemdet Nasser period, circa 3000 BC, depicting Anana as an eye goddess, alongside her familiar eight-petaled rosette. There. Figure 7. The sacred iconography surrounding the Akkadian Ishtar, reveals the same basic images. Thus, figure 8 shows Ishtar, Venus, together with an eight-spoked wheel, while figure 9 shows Ishtar, Venus, together with an eight-pointed star. Figure 10 shows Ishtar in conjunction with a rosette-like star. The fact that the planet Venus is associated with the very same forms in Mesoamerica, where the observation and worship of our sister planet formed an obsession, strongly supports the conclusion that such images have their own origin in the ancient appearance of the planet. The same conclusion is supported by the fact that cultures as distant and disparate as those of the Australian Aborigines, Maya, Polynesians, and Chinese describe Venus by epithets signifying great eye, great star, and luminous flower. How are we to explain this curious state of affairs, whereby Venus is associated with the very symbols 
seemingly depicted in prehistoric sun images, surely not by reference to the current solar system, for Venus does not even vaguely resemble an eye, eight-pointed star, or flower. Yet if Venus only recently appeared superimposed against the backdrop of Saturn, Shamash, as per the reconstruction offered by Talbot and myself, depicted in figure one, its role as an eye is explained at once. Upon further evolution of the polar configuration, Venus assumed a radiant appearance, sending forth streamers across the face of the ancient sun god. See figure 11. This situation is reflected in the latter two images in figure 3, and accounts for, for Venus' role as a star or luminous flower. planets in ancient lore. At the turn of the century, it was widely held that the most sacred traditions of the creation, deluge, golden age, dragon combat, etc., were nature myths describing the stereotypical behavior of the two primary celestial bodies. Typically, in allegorical or humoristic fashion, the Saturn theory offers a similar conclusion with the all-important proviso that the planets formerly dominated the celestial and intellectual horizons rather than the current sun and moon, that the earliest gods and mythical figures of the various cultures are celestial in nature, is easily shown. The Sumerian goddess Anana, explicitly identified with the planet Venus already at the dawn of the historical period, circa 3300 BCE, is a case in point and might well serve as an exemplar for comparative analysis. Virtually every ancient culture will feature a goddess with notable structural affinities to Inanna, although the identification with Venus is not always preserved. The Pawnee Indians of the American Central Plains, for example, celebrate the wondrous deeds of the primeval goddess Kiputika, Kiputika identified with Venus. It was her union with the warrior god Pararaku, Pararaku explicitly identified with the planet Mars which signaled the crowning event of creation. The second god, Tirawahat, placed in the heavens was evening star, known to the white people as Venus. She was a beautiful woman by speaking and waving her hands. She could perform wonders through this star and morning star, Mars. All things were created. She is the mother of the Skiri. Skiri. As the Pawnee traditions attest, the planet Mars played a prominent role in ancient myth and religion. Wherever one looks, one will find the red planet accorded a numinous power wildly out of proportion to its present modest appearance. The Sumerian war god Nurgle, early on identified with the planet Mars, forms a pivotal figure in comparative analysis. Thus, it can be shown that war gods and warrior heroes from every corner of the globe share numerous characteristics in common with the Sumerian god, including some of a remarkable specific nature. To take but one mythical theme of hundreds available, the Makiritari Indians of the Amazonian rainforest tell of a time when the hero, Ahizahama, identified with the red planet, climbed a giant stairway to the sky. The fact that a very similar story was related of Nurgle in ancient Mesopotamia suggests that the mythical theme originated in objective historical events involving the red planet. Yet, one looks in vain for a satisfactory explanation of this particular mythical theme given the current order of the solar system. 
wherein a celestial stairway is not to be found. Neolithic rock art, however, offers countless examples of stairway-like appendages descending from the ancient sun god, thereby complementing and helping to illuminate the universal myth of a luminous stairway spanning the heavens. See figure 12. The possibility thus presents itself that the stairway to heaven was a visible apparition associated with the ancient sun god during a particular phase of the polar configuration towards a science of mythology. With the goal of developing a rigorous scientific methodology for the study of ancient myth, the Saturnists would offer a series of basic ground rules deemed to be essential if researchers are to discover the true significance and message of ancient mythical traditions. First and foremost, perhaps, is the general proposition that ancient myth constitutes an invaluable and generally trustworthy source for reconstructing a valid history of our solar system. Far from being a leap of faith, this fundamental finding of the Saturn theory derives from several decades of extensive research into ancient myth and can be demonstrated using normal methods of logic and evidence. A second basic tenet would emphasize the comparative method. Simply stated, no ancient myth or primary cultural institution is fully understandable in isolation. Egyptian myth, to take but one example, is incomprehensible apart from detailed analysis of analogous themes and motifs. From ancient Mesopotamia to the New World, both of which provide the indispensable link to early astronomical traditions all but lost in Egypt itself. Horus's identification with the morning star and Mars offers a notable ex exception in this regard and forms a close analog to the Pawnee traditions surrounding the red planet. Hathor's identification with the Eye of Ra, for example, can only be understood by reference to the widespread idea whereby Venus once formed the central eye of the ancient sun god. Note further that Hathor's name, which signifies House of Horus, captures perfectly the essence of the relationship between Venus and Mars. As illustrated in Figure 1, the planet goddess Hathor Venus, as the Eye of Ra, literally housed the warrior Horus Mars. It is little wonder then, given the reconstruction offered here, that the Egyptian pyramid and coffin texts implore the dead king, as Horus, to ascend the numinous celestial ladder in order to join Ra and reign in the mansion of Hathor in the sky. I am Horus, give me the ladder which you gave to my father so that I may ascend on it to the sky and escort Ra. The third basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that ancient myth and ritual typically commemorate dramatic events witnessed by human beings. If myth constitutes a creative interpretation of the traumatic celestial events in pseudo-historical terms, the flooding of the world, the warrior heroes consorting with a beautiful goddess, ritual, originated as a purposeful and remarkably fateful attempt to reenact the fateful events in question. Mars, climbing out of the celestial stairway, for example, was reenacted in countless sacred rites throughout the ancient world. The archetypal rite of the sacred marriage, attested already at the dawn of history in Mesopotamia, purports to commemorate the king's union with the planet Venus, Anana. The original inspiration for this bizarre rite, as I have theorized, was the spectacular conjunction of Venus and Mars in prehistoric times. A fourth basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that historical evidence together with consistent or widespread human testimony must be given credence. Even if a ready explanation of such testimony is not immediately obvious or appears to contradict current scientific opinion, Velikovsky's admonition in the preface to Worlds in Collision serves as a rallying cry here. If occasionally historical evidence does not square with the formulated laws, it should be remembered that a law is but a deduction from experience in the experiment. Therefore, laws must conform with historical facts, not facts with laws. The famous controversy over the likelihood that rocks, meteors, could fall from the sky, a possibility denied by several of the best minds of the 18th and 19th centuries, might well serve as a prototype here, formally dismissed as too ridiculous to merit serious discussion. The fact that meteorites occasionally fall to earth from heaven was well known to the ancient Sumerians, all but lost for several millennia 
Such knowledge is once again commonplace amongst schoolboys everywhere. Equally lesson laden is the ongoing controversy over the possibility that rocks from Mars could somehow find their way to Earth. Fervently denied by various leading authorities until quite recently, circa 1987, the eventual triumph of the Martian meteorite hypothesis is yet another classic example of the leading paradigms of the scientific age being instantly overturned by a series of anomalous findings. Such examples could be multiplied ad infinitum. Science, much like religion, proves to be notoriously malleable in this regard. What is considered impossible or futuristic by one generation might well come to be accepted by future generations unencumbered by similar prejudices. A fifth basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that reoccurring anomalies in ancient myth and tradition offer a key to discover. Certainly, it is most unlikely that one culture would invent traditions of fire-breathing dragons or witches that once threatened to eclipse the ancient sun god. Yet, when one finds the very same improbable motif from one ancient culture to another, logic suggests that something other than fantasy and coincidence is at work here, unencumbered by similar prejudices. A sixth central tenet of the Saturn theory holds that the history and evolution of the polar configuration constitutes nothing less than the history of the gods. The birth of the warrior hero, the warlike rampage of the mother goddess, the death or eclipse of the primeval sun god, and a thousand different themes alike, all have their inspiration in the spectacular events associated with the evolution of the polar configuration. A seventh basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that future discoveries vis-a-vis -vis the geology and geomorphology of the respective planets will act to either confirm or deny the model. For it stands to reason that, if the extraordinary history described here has any basis in reality, such events must have left an indelible mark on the planets that participated in the polar configuration. It is also expected that some of these telltale signs of participation in the polar configuration will prove to be difficult, if not impossible, to explain by any other model. A fundamental objection to the Saturn theory. The most obvious objection to the Saturn theory is its apparent incompatibility with conventional astrophysics. This is, indeed, a formidable objection, one deserving of serious attention and ultimately a valid answer ideally in terms of offering a viable physical model for the polar configuration. While promising steps towards achieving a viable physical model have been achieved, the models of Grubal and Driscoll, for example, such attempts have thus far proved preliminary and only partly successful. Much work remains to be done in this area, preferably by scientists trained in the requisite fields of astronomy, physics, and mechanics. Personally, I remain confident that an answer will be found if for no other reason than it is highly improbable that a theory with so much historical evidence in its favor could prove entirely illusory. If the history of science teaches us anything, it is there is ample precedent for reserving judgment on a historical thesis well supported by evidence but lacking a viable physical model. Darwin's theory of evolution, to take a particularly notorious example, languished for decades under the objection that it lacked a viable model of heredity, which could explain how the much-needed genetic changes could originate and come to be fixed rather than blended as per earlier models of heredity. Already by the time of Darwin, there was a wealth of evidence that evolution had occurred. How else are we to explain the fact that modern whales occasionally show traces of vestigial hind limbs and hip girdles, but a viable model of heredity was not yet at hand? to say nothing of a chemical model for genetic mutation or embryonic differentiation. Even today, well over a hundred years later, many of the most fundamental questions surrounding the biochemical mechanisms of evolution remains unanswerable. We still have little understanding of how the various phyla originated or why some species proved successful why others became extinct. In the meantime, however, while modern biology awaits a solution to these truly perplexing and formidable mysteries, no informed scientist can doubt the historical reality that biological evolution has occurred. The question is how did life evolve and by what precise means? A similar situation surrounds the Saturn theory in my opinion. Here too the historical evidence is unequivocal that various planets once participated in a polar configuration 
and wreaked havoc with the inner solar system. The question is, how are we to understand these tumultuous historical events from the standpoint of physics? F. Cochran. Good read. The one biggest hurdle for me is how could, how could the ancients worship these bloodthirsty killers they got when it would be a speck in the sky that takes 29 years to orbit the sun. As they say, that dog don't hunt. That is the biggest conundrum of all. And also all the worldwide iconography and it's all still with us today. It's amazing how much Saturn is in our culture. All right, that'll do it for me. Thank you for all of you that have donated, and please like, share, and comment on this video so more people can see it. Take care. I'll see you on down the road.
Là, c'est ici, nous lisons avec différentes yeux, avec différentes mains. La première partie de notre collision signifie pour nous. Nous sommes dans un état d'une victime d'amnésie. And the humankind is a victim of amnesia. And a victim of amnesia does not act responsibly. He acts irrationally. If he comes into conjunction with Saturn, it means the holy books, that is, Judaism, which is older than the others, just as Saturn is this the father is of the, the planets. Modern if Jupiter comes into conjunction with Mars, it means the Chaldean law, which teaches the worship of fire. If it is with the sun, it means the Egyptian law which means that one worships the celestial army led by the sun. If with Venus, it means the law of the Saracens, which is pleasure-loving and lascivious, and if it is with Mercury, the mercurial law, which is Christianity, until, at last, the law of the moon will come to disturb it, and that is the sect of the Antichrist. It should be mentioned that this theory would later be explicitly rejected by Ficino on account of its overly deterministic character. In Picatrix, however, each of the planets have their own respective religions to govern, but the planet-to-religion breakdown differs somewhat from that of Abu Mashar's Great Conjunction Scheme. Picatrix's breakdown is as follows. Saturn Judaism, Jupiter, Christianity, Mars, heresy and apostasy, the Sun, paganism or Sabaeanism, Venus, Islam, Mercury, philosophy, materialism and skepticism, and the Moon, those who worship idols and images. What the theory of Great Conjunctions and Picatrix do have in common, however, is the fundamental association between Saturn and the Jews. Here, by virtue of their mutual antiquity, both the Hebrew and Chaldean tongues are kept under Saturn's jurisdiction. Astrology was no mere tabloid trifle or isolated discipline during this era. To use the words of Eugenio Garin, the Middle Ages were greatly concerned with, quote, astrology and religion, astrology and politics, astrology and propaganda, but also astrology and medicine, astrology and science, a philosophy of history, a conception of reality, a fatalistic naturalism, and an astral cult. Astrology was all these and more. End quote. What came to a head in the Italian Renaissance was the sheer volume of all these different astrological ideas, with all their internal contrasts and contradictions building up to what Thomas Kuhn would describe as the crisis preceding the paradigm shift. And all this was happening precisely while the Studia Humanitatis began remapping these astral deities with imagery drawn up from the classics. One curious element of this fascination with astrology and culture was what Moshe Idel called the Saturnization of Judaism and in turn the Judaization of Saturn. 
By the end of this process, in the late 15th and 16th centuries, even European Jewish Kabbalists like Yohanan Alamano, working from earlier Spanish or Sephardic sources, were expressing the astromagical link between ancient history, the land of Israel, Moses, the Temple, the Torah, prophetic inspiration, the Sabbath, and esoteric knowledge with Saturn. I will read you a fairly extensive quote by Yohanan Alamano right here. Uh, this is from an untitled treatise on the Sephirot of Binah. And the third sphere, that of Saturn, is a supreme and noble one, higher than all the other planets, which is the reason that the ancient sages said about it that it generated all the other planets. And they say that Saturn is the true judge and the planet of Moses, peace be with him. The angel of Saturn is Michael, the great minister, so called because of his great power in divine matters, and he is the ministering angel of Israel. And the astrologers who have described Saturn say that it endows man with profound thought, law, and the spiritual sciences, the Chokmot Ruhaniot, prophecy, Nevoa, sorcery, Kishuf, prognostication, and the Shemitot and Yohala. The Jewish people and the Hebrew language and the temple are under its jurisdiction. Saturn's major conjunction is with Jupiter in the dominion of Pisces, and occurs to assist the nation and the Torah and its prophets. This planet endows the people with perfection in sciences and divine matters such as the Torah and its commandments, out of its sublimity because it is spiritual. It is concerned only with thought, understanding, and design, esoteric knowledge, and divine worship, and his Torah, and the Sabbath day is in its sway, because its nature causes material existence to cease, and all the operations that do not correspond to it are forbidden, because it corrupts and destroys all destructions. And lightning, that is fire, should not be done under its aegis, that is, during the Sabbath, because it is cold, and if they keep its spiritual rules and laws, it will impart a spiritual influx abundantly. But if they do not keep the way of God, it will spit forth everything that is bad. Prophecy will occur to fools and to babes in an insufficient manner, and to women and to melancholics, and to those possessed by an evil spirit and maleficent demons that obliterate the limbs and bad counsels and sorceries and anxieties and erroneous beliefs. So Idel takes this passage to represent the Saturnization of Judaism as inspired by the writings of the Toledan rabbi Abraham ibn Ezra, whose dates are 1089 to 1164, but also to his circle of commentators. This he does on account of its numerous parallels with the passages that follow here, and it's quite possible that his description of the links between Saturn and Judaism were also shaped by an acquaintance with the Picatrix in one of its forms, whether directly or indirectly. <laughs> 